My name is Rich Schmidt. It is December 11th, 2017. We're here at Illahi Vineyard. Uh, we're talking to Lowell Ford today. And Lowell, we're gonna start you out by asking why wine? Why what? Why wine? Why wine? Uh, I didn't wanna have a winery. Um, I, you, you, the, the better question would have been grapes. I wanted to grow grapes. I had been growing since 1983 and selling our grapes to um, uh, a lot of different wineries uh, over the years. And uh, my plan was to buy a site that would produce much better Pinot Noir than our other farm in West Salem. And so uh, uh, we looked around. Uh, my wife and I would um, look for property that had the right aspect. And um, one time we were driving on uh, the road nearby here, and I saw that hill, this hillside. And um, then I went to the county courthouse and researched out who owned it and approached uh, the couple and um, they said no. <laughs> uh, and the, but for some reason after about a week or two I think their finances and that sort of thing, oh okay well maybe we will sell you 80 acres. And so it worked out. So in 2000 uh, we began um, this site and the reason we look for this site, I said was growing Pinot Noir, because at our other site, which we started growing in 1983, um, uh, I, I planted a number of different varieties. Um, I like to experiment. But, of course, I wanted to do Pinot Noir, and it was horrible. Yeah, the, the soil was deep. It was very rich. It's Willamette, uh, called Willamette Valley. Um, and it is uh, great for growing uh, gr um, cherries and uh, pumpkins. And, but oh, it just produced the worst uh, Pinot Noir. Now, the white wines over at our other farm are, are terrific. Pin Pinot Gris, which I planted in 1993, um, 1991, uh, it, uh, it, it's beautiful. And we grow Viognier over there and just have planted Chardonnay at that site. But, and, and I grew a number of different varieties like Ehrenfelser and uh, uh, Portuguese Blue and uh, probably about five or six different other varieties, mostly, mostly German whites. But was not satisfied, and the Portuguese blue was horrible. <laughs> uh, you probably don't even know that variety, but the Aaron Feltzer and a few few others, uh, Kariner and others that I experimented with. Um, so um, that's why we have uh, two farms for Illahi Vineyards and grapes. Our plan was, my wife and I, to develop this property to complete the harvest, sell the grapes, and do traveling in the, uh, during the winter months. Um, but uh, my son, uh, who is our winemaker, uh, came to me and said, and this was about 2004 or five, said, you know, uh, he was a grants writer and uh, taught uh, writing classes and poetry and that, but he said, I'm really bored with grants writing, and I want to do something more creative. I want to make wine. So that's how we got into the wine industry. And you know, we had a discussion. He went through Schumacher Community College's uh, wine studies program and learned both the viticulture and the enology side of things, and then went on to uh, Portland State for um, uh, organic chemistry and microbiology and, and those uh, additional courses. Um, and what I found with him was the creative side of a person, uh, you know, English majors, um, you know, what's the old joke, uh, what do they have to learn to say upon graduation, do you want fries with that? Uh, and, uh, but he was teaching it in, in that and, and, and enjoyed that part of it, but not, not the part where he was waiting to write additional uh, governmental stuff. 
So I came here and that creative side attached with a scientific side of you know, organic chemistry and that, uh, I think personally, <laughs> unbiased of course, <laughs> he's a terrific winemaker. And he's also, we have the name, we don't call our Pinot Noir a reserve. It's called Percheron. And Percheron are the name of the horses that we use in the vineyard. So our two big black Percheron uh, brother and sister, uh, they, for some of our uh, cuvées, bring the grapes up here and they mow and they, uh, take a cart around and that sort of thing, and we, we like to use them in, um, in our operation. Uh, but then it, Brad has come up with uh, the names of some of our wines, or Bon Sauvage, the Noble Savage, and then he's got uh, um, uh, 1899. Now that's, that's a um, wine that's made without any use of petroleum, uh, hydraulics, uh, electricity, uh, any conveniences that you would generally not find in 1899. Um, it quite frankly drove me crazy. I, I like to drive a tractor, things are done quick and that. And Brad said to me, Dad, that's the whole purpose that we're doing this. We want you to slow down we want every part of the winemaking process to be segmented into a slow process. And so we would know, we and everybody that works here, uh, would know then the, these are the components. And it makes a great story. Um, you know, we've been interviewed a number of times for that and it is interesting and uh, there's just this last year we were named one of the 10 hottest brands in the United States by Wine Business Monthly um, just because it's a little different in that uh, we're small about 12 or 14,000 cases right now um, and but we're growing and, and it's a family business so um, your first question got a long answer yeah. And actually we got into the whole business because in the late 70s we heard about the grape nuts and in, in we learned about these people that are involved and we have a, another farm that's um, been in my wife's family for 75 years and um, uh, we were growing uh, cherries at that time uh, and I was working at Chemeketa Community College and then during the summers I would spray and harvest the cherries and that and cherry Willamette Valley cherry growers said to us you only have a couple acres you're too small you don't have a big enough volume for us where that's the end well Pauline and I started looking well what would we plant kiwis kiwis were kind of a big interesting thing at that point in time uh, and we found a lot of people that that had tried them and it had not worked out well. Uh, but grapes really got our interest. And so in the very, either late 70s or early 80s, we went to a grape day that OSU had um, put on in, in, in Canby. And um, that really sparked our interest. So uh, that combined with one of my best friends from a, a high, little tiny high school over on the coast, returned from Germany where as a physician he had lived there and he had uh, got to know people and worked in a winery and in a vineyard over there and came back and, and he planted uh, Vita Springs uh, vineyards. And um, that got my interest and so we planted um, Mueller Turgau. Uh, and uh, my first sale was to Dickey Rath and that wine went into Coastal Mist. Um, which was, I, I'm sure they don't make it anymore. <laughs> uh, not only that, then when my son became winemaker, he said, I'm never gonna make Mueller Turgau. So, uh, <laughs> and it is an entry level wine and not a high level wine, even though I think it can be made really good if 
the winemaker chooses to. So. So how did you choose the name Ilihi? And, and tell us a little bit about your label as well. Okay, um, Ilihi uh, means soil and earth and the community of people living at that site, uh, you know, kind of on that dirt. And um, we chose that after spending a number of weeks um, uh, and we, I had taken the Oregon Geographical Names book and we wanted to be northwest we didn't want to be a casa or a you know look like we were in france or southern spain or italy or something we wanted to be northwest so that's why we started going through and ilihi is of course it's used close here ilihi hills there's an ilihi Falls. There's a little town down by um, Grants Pass out in the mountains, um, unincorporated town that's called Illahi. Uh, and it is the uh, Chinook Indian language, which was, which was the trade language. So Illahi would have been known from Northern California uh, well into British Columbia. And um, so we thought that also matched our Oregon green um, kind of natural, sustainable, um, our beliefs, really. So we believe that the uh, wine is made in the vineyard and um, in the, that terroir. So um, it fit, it just naturally fit for us. Um, it does present problems as we're selling outside of the state that um, they have problems saying it and, uh, and what it is or something. But I also found that at, actually at Shemekada, people would always say, well, how do you say that? What is that place? But it created an interest. And Ilihi does create an interest. People ask about it. So that's how we chose the name. Um, the label uh, was designed by a New York artist who is a minimalist. And that's what he did for a couple cases of wine. Uh, and, and he came back with this particular, it's a font that was developed in the 1800s. The design ha is very minimal, it does not have uh, artwork on it and, and that, and um, qu quite frankly, I wasn't very excited about it when I saw it. I liked the flourish of color and that. And um, my daughter-in-law and my son said, no, this is what we're gonna go with. And it has proved to be terrific. It is great. Um, there, there is a, a study that's done that Wines sell within 10 seconds on the shelf. You're never gonna get more than 10 second review. And so what grabs you? So the white um, format with a bold name <clears throat> has, has worked out quite well for us. So. so as you set out to replace cherries with grapes, how did you, what, what was the learning curve? What, what proved to be uh, the, sort of the challenges of growing wine grapes? Okay. Well, I would say it's still going on <laughs> after 34 or five years. Uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges back then was where do you get your information? Um, there was the Grape Day, which was put on once a year. Uh, there were the, uh, the extension agent, um, Bra Mr. Brown, he really helped me out a lot. And my original planting of Mueller Turgau was probably the right trellis system. It, uh, Scott Henry trellis system were, uh, because of deep soils and that, you double the uh, canopy, one half goes up, the other half goes down. Uh, I still use that uh, on the, the, that site. Um, and it was the best. It, it didn't work for the Pinot Noir, though. Uh, Pinot Noir is far more 
um, picky. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's more of a challenge. But, but yes, they're, they're, where did I get a spray schedule, for example, or help with sprays? Um, and it was difficult. We, we used a, a lot of sulfur back then. Uh, now we're live certified and salmon safe and all that, and so we rotate the different chemical groups and families every time. So you may only use one group twice in a spray uh, uh, schedule. Um, so that was difficult. Um, and then talk to your neighbors. Uh, that was the other thing, so that hopefully you wouldn't main, uh, commit their mistakes too. And uh, Earl Van Valkenburg was um, my, my friend that I referred to. So, and he's a physician, so he knew the chemistries and, and that, and he gave me very good advice on, on raising uh, or growing grapes. And so I assume you sort of developed a grape growing philosophy over the years. So do you, do you, can you explain what that is and how you sort of came to it? Well, the, like I said, I, I believe that um, uh, the wine is made in the vineyard, so you need to grow a healthy plant and you need to grow, um, uh, produce a grape uh, that balances the uh, what a soil and aspect and site will produce the best. What we do here at this site is all VSP and we, do, we plant between the rows. We do not rototill between the rows or introduce nitrogen back into the soil um, directly. So we um, try to minimize that. We don't want a lot of green growth. We want the fruit to be generally small and intense. Um, and then I would say live, the live program uh, allows, very, fits very much with our philosophy of um, low impact uh, chemicals used in, in the vineyard. And we want to, um, uh, re reduce any residuals or that. We want it to be as, quote, green as possible. So. And why is that important to you? Uh, that I, I believe that uh, in that, I, I don't want a lot of chemicals used. Um, I don't want to intervene with what uh, Mother Nature does um, as much as possible. Um, th that goes to more of an extreme for our 1899, which we have a block, and that uh, we are even more persnickety about, very, very careful about. So, so why? Uh, so tell us a bit more about sort of sustainability in the wine industry and sort of why the the movement toward it and why you see the importance in the future. Well, I strongly believe. I kind of like the the whole organ concept. We're in. Um, 38 states now and uh, five countries. And I can tell you that our biggest sales outside of Oregon are in states that really value um, being uh, very conscious of the environment. Boston or, or Massachusetts, we sell almost as much as we sell in Oregon. It's our biggest state uh, sales. Um, followed by New York um, and then uh, Colorado. And surprisingly, I never thought we'd ever sell wine in California because, I mean, they're awash in wine. Uh, they don't need one more winery. But our sales in um, Los Angeles uh, are growing at a rate that uh, is very pleasing, uh, uh, very good. I'm just real pleased with that. So uh, I think our price too. And then the whole Oregon, like Oregon Pinot Noir is, anyone that's into wines at all knows Oregon, so. 
So you mentioned earlier that you have some of your production horse powered. Yes. I'm just sort of curious how you how that works and uh, and why you choose to do it that way. Well, I don't know what uh, Brad was reading uh, about. He's working on a book, a book on the history of winemaking. That, that it, and I think it, you know he's reading books and books and books about this sort of stuff. And, um, and then he said well, about let's let's do that. And I get back to he, he believes that using um, horses and is getting us back to knowing more about um, making wine. That isn't our only experiment. We have been uh, working on uh, making our own vessels um, um, pot with pottery to be able to make wine in um, amphoras. And the, pr the problem is uh, getting amphoras. And we've gone through a couple different potters. <laughs> and. Um, uh, a retired um, pottery teacher is now working for us. We have a kiln. We built a wood-fired kiln down at the, on one of our buildings down below, and um, we've had a lot of failures. <laughs> one of the problems is I'm looking to see if it, it's not here right now, but we have a, a fairly large um, structure, place in which we can put the slip in and to make uh, um, a, an amphora. But the problem is you pour it in there and then you, you dump out the slip and then the sides have caved in. So we, and then some of those that we've done and fired, um, some have broken and so we, we wanted to really put this into practice um, a couple of years ago. It still hasn't come out. We can go for, what, $10,000 and buy a pre-made one. Um, that's possible. But that doesn't fit with our um, philosophy of we want to do it on our own and want to learn from it and that. So one of these days out here on, in the uh, grass. Brad wants to have an area where he buries amphoras and then uh, makes the wine in those. So. So we've been experimenting all along. Yes. And, and we do that in the vineyard as well as over there. We've done it here. Uh, one of my early uh, experiments at home was growing Gruner Feltliner and planted that also in about uh, 91. And, uh, and I only put in about, oh, I would say about 22 plants. And it gave us enough to always have at least 15, 20 gallons of finished wine. And it was so popular that we would make it and it wouldn't make it past into the new year uh, the relatives would have gobbled it all up. They just, they really liked it. And so uh, we planted an acre and a half when we came to this site. And um, we are among the very first producers of Gruner Veltliner. Um, you know, I grew, grew it and sold it. So, and curiously enough, um, there is uh, Rotzel, this uh, in southern Oregon, um, they got the name approved and sold it commercially as an individual. Often the, my Gruner would be thrown in with uh, uh, Mueller Turgau or something like that because it was not very big. But Brad has made that very well and one of our bragging points is it was served to the last president of the United States in Portland, Maine with uh, seafood. Uh, the chef chose it because it goes so well, it has high citric acid, and it w goes great with seafoods. So that's Gruner. Right next to it is uh, Tempranillo, which we uh, are the only producers of a Tempranillo rosé that I'm aware of in Oregon. 
Um, and that is a very fast seller. And now we buy uh, uh, th three different vineyards grow it here. And it has to be in the valley. Can't, uh, we don't want a uh, hot climate tempranillo. So uh, we buy from three different vineyards now. And it uh, sells very rapidly, very quickly. And next to that <laughs> is um, Right, is what we call Little Italy. And we have, uh, I've done some research, and we have three different red wine grapes that are grown at the base of the Alps at, uh, across from Austria uh, and um, in the Alto Adige region. And um, so we grow Lagrain. Uh, Traldigo and Scappatino. Scappatino, I gotta get an I in there, Scappatino. Um, and we're now just this year made three different barrels uh, because we only have two tenths of an acre of each variety. But what, what we're looking for and trying to get is a wine, a grape that will grow and mature well in the Willamette Valley that is not Pinot Noir. And it's a very heavy, dense, all three of these, uh, real dense, uh, you know, just almost black. Um, and uh, so we do barrel tastings, um, and people have tried it, they really like it, but, but we'll see. I think it'll be okay for, you can always, uh, sell two tenths of an acre of something, um, uh, but what we're after is a, a table wine that is, uh, like I say, uh, more in the bigger, bold taste profile than Pinot Noir. So you started out with kind of German variety, and and now you've got French, and you've got Spanish, and you've got Italian. So you're you're just kind of taking whatever you want to plant and, and kind of making it work. Well, uh, yeah, but it's also, it, it's, if you only do two tenths of an acre, it, it's, it's fun. Sure. Um, it's a little more of a challenge than if you just grew Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there would be a lot of people on a, you know, with a business model that would say, hmm, you know, you're, dividing your uh, customers up and that, but I don't think that's true. Oregon, Oregon population, they're very, very um, Oregon wine um, dedicated. They want Pinot Noir even if the restaurant is uh, selling Mexican food or is anything. They, they it, they want Oregon wine. And they're a little more sophisticated. They're more like maybe a lot of the, the Californians in the Napa and Sonoma area, that like that. They're, they're very proud of what our state is doing, as you well know, I think. Uh, so. so tell me a little bit about your, you talked about your, your son coming into the family business. Tell us about the, kind of the family business, business dynamic and how you've kind of worked out your, your various roles. Okay. Well, and, I, and I'll be up front to say that um, parents working with their children and grandchildren, in this case, um, it isn't, I mean, we're a family still. <laughs> uh, I guess you can read between the lines. There can be disagreements. And my son, I, I'll be, he's far more educated in making wine and uh, constant, he's a constant reader, and, and uh, so it, I have probably more experience in the vineyard over the years, and he's got more in education and experience in wine, and so more and more we're shifting the business structure, too, that he's now the president of our corporation, um, and our family involves my daughter-in-law, is our wine salesperson. She's the one that goes to these different states and uh, sells our wines. And um, 
and although Brad went to Britain, he's, he got us in there, and uh, he got a, a, a trip out of that. And so we're in Canada and uh, Sweden and Belgium, just small amounts, but enough to um, give a little more spice to things. So, um, and then I have another son that's a school teacher who's um, not directly involved in uh, this in the wine business and doesn't necessarily have a desire. So we have structured our business so that we have LLCs that accommodate the two boys and a corporation that accommodates the, the wine business. And uh, my wife's involved every day too. She's the babysitter and loves it and uh, is with our three-year-old right now at home. Uh, ours, my, <laughs> my son's. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, so every, and then the grandkids, the two older boys, they worked here this summer. Um, I don't know if they have a long-term interest. They're still, you know, uh, 18 and 22 and so. Uh, and in fact, kind of a funny thing, my son that is the winemaker, when we did our winter pruning and the boys were in high school, I would go through and make the major cuts and then they had to strip the vines and they just, just hated me. Dad, you're just so, why are you making us go out and work in the cold and the rain? And, and then one becomes, uh, goes into the industry. So there is that. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it, it affects the grandkids. We'll see. But if they can survive it, they can stay in it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you've mentioned uh, Chemeketa a couple of times. And I know you played a role in the development of the Northwest Wine Center. Yes. Studies Center. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that and your, in okay. your role. All right. <clears throat> um, I was a dean at the college, and uh, among the programs in my area just happened to be farm business and farm business management and the uh, uh, different classes there. So I had a relationship um, at that point in time, and I, I retired uh, from the college um, after uh, 28 years. and was thinking, well, you know, adults couldn't get a, a class in grape growing, vineyard management, or winemaking. You could go to OSU, but you needed to, you know, take maybe a year or two of chemistry, and you had to do all the prerequisites before you took any fermentation classes. So, and that, that didn't fit adults at all. So I proposed to the president when I retired, I says, I'd like to teach a vineyard management class. And he said, yeah, okay, give it a try. And so we did. And the first class um, I taught in 1998, and it was just so many people, we could only, the, the room could not hold. So we had to say, no, you know, you're on a waiting list. And the next term was the same way. The next term was the same way. And so then the, the college president said, well, okay, maybe we should really hire a real instructor. <laughs> and we laughed over. And that's true. I don't have a background in it. So we did hire um, Al. Uh, who, who taught the classes for quite a few years, and my son took his classes. <clears throat> and he had a longer experience and really a terrific instructor. And, um, but not too long after that, then uh, Barney Watson came from OSU and taught the winemaking classes, and that was my son's instructor. And we added some other part-timers who had particular areas of interest, like uh, wine appreciation, uh, Bob Sogi was great at that, um, just terrific. And so, um, and the other thing was, well, I was told very early in this, well, don't plan on us doing, you know, really getting into this a big time because uh, it's expensive to have a full-time instructor and all that. And, but 
in West Salem, there was a park, a county park, that the county uh, commissioners had closed down because of uh, a lot of abuses that occurred there after hours and trash and drug use and all kinds of problems. And um, one of the other deans uh, came up with this idea because we were uh, wanting to expand our presence in Dallas. And the idea was, hey, Polk County, we will trade you space in the academy building for that uh, property. And it was a great deal for us because then we got that park and it is an ideal setting for uh, a, a vineyard. Just above the river, faces south, um, jory soils, everything. And so uh, we applied for a federal um, e uh, rural economic development grant and got that. Um, a lot of us chipped in money and the, uh, which was then called the Viticulture Center, was established, the Northwest Viticulture Center. Uh, I like to brag about it because it was one year before Walla Walla established their program, but uh, uh, theirs got a lot more money and they really have a beautiful program there too. Um, later we got enough to build the building. We have a bonded winery there. Um, uh, a lot of the instruction um, takes place there. Um, it, and we have students from literally all over the world. We had. Uh, Two students uh, complete the program in, uh, from Japan, uh, had a student from uh, Burgundy. Uh, we even had a couple from Iowa that had a vineyard out there, but also property here, and, and they kind of shuttled, or still do, but they uh, created a, a winery back there. So, uh, and, and it's a, a great program because it, the whole idea is hands-on. We got a vineyard there, so a student may be given these four rows and they have to prune those and that grapes come in or pressed and those go into the wine. So they do from the beginning through to the barrel tasting and the bottling. Uh, we have a bottling line there and uh, the wine is sold also. So the, it, it, it's been it's way more than I would have ever envisioned when I began teaching the classes. So, Were you surprised by the number or the type of people who showed up at the very beginning? Yes. Were you surprised by the demand? Yes. Four physicians, a judge, a lawyer, an executive at Intel took the class, um, a student from the Dalles, would drive over once a week. A student, uh, probably the furthest south, was just uh, down by Eugene and, and around there, and a couple students from there that would come up. Um, so, yeah, I was, but, I, but, it, but it clicked. These are people that had, they had money, they had uh, the ability, uh, you know, physicians, they, they had taken a lot of chemistry and, and that, so they were in tune to winemaking right off. Um, and a couple went on, uh, Cubanismo. Um, uh, Maurice was in my class. I always, whenever I go there, brag that, yeah, he was one of my students. <laughs> he's, he's a neat guy. And th there were a couple of other wineries and a number, quite a few, vineyards from that class. Uh, or classes then over the four terms. So, yeah. So what are your kind of thoughts overall on wine, wine education in the Northwest? I'm pretty excited about it because if you uh, look at Oregon and Washington, well in California, cause, because we copied. We, uh, I went down to Napa Valley Community College and, um, and on over to uh, um, to Santa Rosa and looked at, got, gleaned their programs and what we put, to, what I, I wrote up the original classes that got the state approval. Um, uh, and they had to, it had to be custom made to 
cool climate or cool climate viticulture is compared to what they have down there. But it, it still was great. But you take all those people and the education and, uh, you know, you look at it now, we have uh, Southern Oregon, Oregon State, Umpqua Community College. Um, uh, we've got Linfield now. PCC does teach some classes, Shemekita does. And, uh, some, and then a couple of the classes are online. So, you know, um, they can take it anywhere in the world, actually, uh, for some classes. And, uh, well, I'm going to digress for one second, but in Italy, the quality of their wines for a long time kept going down, 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 and they were uh, selling bulk wine. And the young people didn't have where to go to get a good education. They improved all of that in, in Europe. And Italy, its quality of their wines had just gone up. I think in Oregon, Washington, California, um, North Carolina, people from here have gone back to teach classes there. If you, we have a nice educational population to draw from. Our assistant winemaker, he graduated uh, from uh, Shemekata and um, worked at Mary Hill and a number of other Oregon wineries before he came here. Um, and we sponsor uh, students to take classes. Uh, at Shemekada. So it's, it's very valuable. We can't, we can't agree more with that, yeah. obviously. <laughs> so. Um, so from your, if you kind of look back over your, your entire time in the industry, back to when you first started planting grapes, what accomplishments are you most proud of? Accomplishments? Yeah. Well, you're sitting in one. I, I would have never expected to um, have a winery. Um, this particular building, uh, we wanted to design it so it uh, wasn't just a production facility. We wanted someone to drive away and say, oh, I remember kind of a different looking building. Where was that place? And um, the first weekend we were open, it all came true to me. A lady walked in and she looked up at the ceiling and she looked around and she said, I'm inside a barrel. <laughs> I had never thought of that at, at that point, but, but if it clicked with her, that's what we were after. Uh, so yeah, I'm very proud of, of this facility. Um, we've expanded, we have um, a cave in this hillside back here and um, hopefully we will do a tasting room um, at some point in time uh, with another building across the driveway. Uh, so th that and family, family involvement. Um, uh, there are others, yeah, the Castiles and um, our, our neighbors, Duches, um, that the kids have followed up and, and continue the legacy. So I, the legacy part of it and without a doubt, the Wine Study Center. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see people, students go through there. Now high school students are feeding into the program. Um, and we have a close relationship with the Yamhill Carlton. Um, and that program was, was very good for high school kids. So, and we're talking to um, 24J, which is Salem School Districts about maybe uh, of having a cooperative program with them. So that part of it I, I really like. And, you know, with it is this collegiality, this, this we're part of a group. There isn't a, there isn't a cutthroat competition. Oregon State, Linfield, you know, two-year schools, I think they work pretty well together. Um, and, they, and they do serve different populations in a way. I think your program starts with passion and then it adds uh, the information, you know. At least that's the way I, I hear it about students getting excited about uh, the area. And if you've got those two together, education and passion, it's pretty exciting.
and the results. Okay. So you talked a little bit about legacy there. Uh, yeah. Do you have a, a plan in place, succession plan, with, uh, with all the family involvement in your winery? We do. Yes. Excellent. Do you want to yeah. share that with us? Well, I mean, it, it involves the lawyers and, <laughs> you know, uh, and quite frankly, my wife and I, we don't need a paycheck. Uh, we're very fortunate to get to the retirement age and we don't need a paycheck. I'd rather it go to my family. I'd rather spend the money buying a, a new tractor or something here um, or a new piece of property. Um, my son right now is working on um, 30 plus acres right up here, clearing it for um, another expansion uh, vineyard up there. Um, uh, so I, I, I believe it's going to be long term, hopefully. Um, so the, the legal side of things really needs to be taken care of sure. so that, you know, when Pauline and I are not here anymore, um, how does it be, how can it be handed off to our kids? Um, and you've got to adjust egos every once in a while. And so, uh, so any, uh, you talk about future expansion already. Do you have any other sort of 5, 10, 15 year out plan? For, we do. For Ilhi? Anything exciting on the horizon? Well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, uh, we wanted to um, d build another building across over here. In fact, we have it, it's approved by the county and all that. But we put it out to contractors for a bid of which took our breath away. And so even though the interest rates are very favorable right now, uh, construction is at a peak and uh, contractors are making up for lost time <laughs> and uh, we have put that on hold. So there's a no on that side. That was part of our five-year plan. Um, the other side of it is we had a goal to achieve in sales in five years, and we have um, more than half achieved that in the first year. It's, we're, um, I'm just, that, it kind of takes my breath away that suddenly, well, you can, despite what you, uh, may see the spelling that's Iowa <laughs> on that on that shipment and um, we we sent two pallets down to California last week and um, to Denmark was a half a pallet uh, so our, our sales are doing very well very good very good so yeah, I'm, those, those things I'm pretty excited about for, um, and maybe we'll be able to, uh, if things slow down a little bit, might be able to build another building. Um, because this is where we do tastings. And there you've got a forklift right there. And some people like that though. I mean, I, uh, you know, if they, they really understand what it takes um, to make wine and then they're right in the middle of it instead of um, a fancy tasting room. Um, they like that. So you said you're about 12 to 14,000 cases right now. Do you have a kind of an ideal size? Boy, I tell you, for you to ask me that, I, I'm, I actually kind of step back and go, I can't believe like five years ago we were at 3,500. You know, uh, I thought, well, if we ever reach 5,000, oh my, that would just be. And then it was 10,000, and then 14, and so. And we're experimenting. Uh, and this is a little trade thing, I guess, but we're experimenting with uh, uh, sparkling wines, but delivered in a very different package. And that's about as far as I want to go with that, that we're, we're trying to do something that is unique.
that no one else is doing. Something to look forward to. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> I even look more if they, they order a second time. We'll see how it works. So. So in addition to, besides size, clearly size has grown, what other changes have you seen in the Oregon industry since you became a part of it? Oh, oh, um, I think one of the big things is um, the respect that we have and like Durans uh, coming into Oregon and the Jacksons and uh, other people coming into Oregon to produce wine. I'm hoping that we don't lose the kind of the pioneer spirit uh, and having it become competitive and I, I mean overly competitive. So, and, and I, so far, without it being, you know, maybe an individual here or there, I, I see a lot of people wanting to work together. Uh, so. so what do you see the future of Oregon wine looking like and, and, what do you, and what do you hope it looks like? Well, like I said, I hope we don't charge people to park in our parking lots. And I am even a little bit bothered by a $125 tasting fee. Um, uh, that and they are, they're not uh, Oregon owners, they're, they're, they own it, but I mean they live out of state and I, 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 don't re that, I don't like that, you know. Yeah, our tasting fee is up to $15 now, which is um, higher than I would like it to be. But our prices, we've kept our prices low so that we can sell to our neighbors and we can sell a second bottle and that, um, I like that. Uh, so. I do see the pressures in the future of moving towards a hundred dollar bottle of wine and prices for property going just out of sight. You know, obviously Jackson is here and they're good neighbors, they're good neighbors. They're here because of um, the quality and the price of property. We're not $125,000 an acre like or, geez, I guess I saw half a million dollars for an acre down in Napa. Um, I, I just hope we don't go that way. Um, so th that's one thing I worry in the future. On the other hand, the variety. You know, if we get people coming from Burgundy here, we, we may learn a whole lot from them. Um, will, we will learn. Uh, and I want the pioneer spirit to remain the experimental side of the industry. Um, I had a fellow here that was an expert in Tempranillo and he refused to taste our Tempranillo Rosé. He said that isn't the way they make it in Spain. And I felt like saying, yeah, Let's experiment. Let's see if there's another way to do this. Um, who knows? So I, I want that, that experimental part. Um, and I like the fact that uh, you can, adults can get education in it uh, and high school kids can, can get education in it. I, I, I would expect that we might see even more community colleges teaching it in Oregon. Um, so. so you're, you're in kind of a unique, question, unique position to answer this last question I have for you okay. because you've seen so many people come through the industry, so many students, so what advice would you have for someone who wants to get into the industry? Well, uh, the biggest advice I'd say is one, get, get an educational experience, you'll learn a lot, and um, experience. Uh, interns. We really have a lot of fun with interns and so when they're here uh, they learn a lot and um, you know it has gone from a lady that uh, graduated from Tufts from New York that didn't know how to drive a car you know because she's in the city 
and she spent her internship here living in the barn down there, you know, uh, a fold-out bed and that, and sure, if you want to stay here uh, on the weekends or, you know, overnight, that kind of stuff. And she didn't drive. She's six weeks, seven weeks. She was up here every day working hard and, and ha really had a fun experience. Um, and we had three uh, ladies from uh, California that uh, came up this year. And... Um, uh, a, a number of guys, you know, I mean, it's, it's just there's probably about eight of us, eight of them, and then an old guy that's uh, around. Uh, my, my main job this year was killing yellow jackets. Yeah, they're horrible during the harvest time, but um, experience and education. Good advice. So. All the questions I have for you. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything I should have asked that I didn't ask? Well, um, I'm excited. I think that uh, about what is occurring in, in Oregon right now with Linfield getting involved and uh, having heard about what they want to provide for their students. And it, I think it's uh, pretty exciting um, of rec thinking it's hard to imagine myself being uh, somebody who, <laughs> I'm so old I'm going into the archives. <laughs> but uh, I, I, th I, I think it's uh, great that you're doing that. I really do. Thank you. So. We won't let the dust come on you in the archives. It's okay. We'll keep you, we'll keep you active back there. Don't worry. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Okay.